Hi everyone, welcome to Landscape and Visual Impact Assessment for glamping, which I should have put on the end there. So what is it and why do we need it? First introduction, my name's Emma, I'm a Chartered Landscape Architect. I'm from Reed Studio, we do landscape, architecture and planning. So the contents of this seminar, what is an LVIA, why is it needed, and I'm going to run through the method, but I'm going to rattle through it quite quickly because it's quite boring, <laughs> and then go on to um, example projects which hopefully you can relate to, and then something might be similar to one of your projects. And finally we'll lead on to the summary which is, do I need an LVIA? So what is a landscape and visual impact assessment, or LVIA which is easier to say? So LVIA is a technique used to assess the effects of change on the landscape and it's used to help design the proposed change. So throughout the process, we look at different ways of designing the landscape um, with all the things we've found out about the landscape and the visual immunity. So there's a, oh, I forgot to bring it with me, but there's a guideline booklet called the Guidelines for Landscape and Visual Impact Assessment, which is written by the Landscape Institutes. And um, that is really the Bible for writing these reports. It's a long document and everybody will have their own individual methodology that they take from that, but it's all very similar. So every assessment really should be using the same methodology when they're looking at assessing the landscape. So when is it needed? Really, the LVIA is really helpful for making planning decisions for the planners. So the National Planning Policy Framework in Section 15 talks about planning policies and decisions should contribute to and enhance the natural and local environment by protecting and enhancing valued landscapes, recognising the intrinsic character and beauty of the countryside. So this should filter down into local policy, so every local authority will have something similar to this, whereby they need to be protecting the natural environment. And so this is where LVIA comes in handy, and it is a way of assessing whether you're going to have a negative effect on the landscape. So there's two different terms, there's the LVIA and there's the LVA. So an LVIA tends to be a more formal document that is submitted for um, alongside an environmental impact assessment for nuclear power plants, quarries, mines, solar farms, highways, really big infrastructure projects. So it's not really likely that you're going to need one of those for a glamping project, but often the local authority might ask for that because they, they get their terminology a bit mixed up. So really you might need a landscape and visual appraisal, which is more of an informal document. It's the same kind of methodology, but it's not, it's not as wordy, and it's just the right pitch for where you're at. Um, but yeah, the core of the approach is similar in both cases. So now I'm going to run through the methods, and I'll try and do it quickly. Um, but firstly, we look at landscape, the baseline conditions of what's there. Then we'll look at the visual amenity, baseline conditions, what's there. Then we'll look at mitigation proposals, design development, and then we, we end up with the assessment of the level of effect. So method of assessment, landscape. So it's quite helpful because there's lots of landscape character assessments out there that give us this tool to have a look at what the landscape looks like at the moment. So there'll be a national level of landscape character assessment. So in England, that's the national character areas and that describes the areas around you and what they look like. Um, in Scotland, I think it's Nature, Nature Scott and in Wales, it's Land Map. Um, and then there'll be local char landscape character assessments. So that'll be borough level, county level, or if you're in an AOMB, they might have written their own landscape character assessment. So these we can look at and we can say, right, well, this is what the landscape around us looks like. Can we maybe take cues from that or feed into that or improve our landscape to look more like the surroundings around us? Um, and then you look at the sites and this is where we start talking about doing your own assessment. So um, we would look at a two kilometre study area and look what's in the study area around you. And we'd sort of make an assessment of the quality of the landscape and would describe it. And then we would value it. So is it designated? Is it an AOMB? Is it a national park? Has it got scenic quality? Has it got rare qualities, um, perceptual aspects? So sometimes it has an association with literature or arts and, and people value it because of that. So this example on the left here, the top image, it's around a village in York. It's a really good quality landscape. It's got good small to medium sized fields. It hasn't been overtaken by large farming. So the fields haven't been amalgamated. All the hedgerows are still intact. There's hedgerow trees. There's the roots that come through it are quite enclosed with hedgerow and um, there's some really um, nice good quality settlements in there and nice architecture um, so it's a good quality landscape and then the site that i was looking at at the bottom didn't really tie into that so hedgerows have been lost field boundaries are not in keeping you can see the 
buildings in the background becoming dilapidated, overgrown with ivy. There was piles of scrap, um, trailers, and all sorts of things cluttering up the landscape. So with this particular site, we can sort of say, well, this has got the capacity for change and improvement. So there's ways that we can get away with putting something in there and say, actually, we're going to improve the landscape here. So it's really important to assess what quality of landscape you have. And then we would say the sensitivity will be high, medium or low of that landscape. So then visual amenity, um, same thing. We take a two kilometer study area around the sites. And so this determines the visual baseline. So this is where it's visible from. The different groups of people that can view it and who, may, who, who, who is experiencing that view and where are they are experiencing it from. So we do a visual mapping exercise. You can do this digitally or manually. I do it manually. So I look on the desktop at the OS mapping. Where is it visible from? I look at the topography, existing vegetation, and I can make quite a good judgment of where I think I'm going to be able to see it from. And then I go on site and I look, and that, that area that I first thought I might be able to see it from usually shrinks down. So this particular landscape is near where I live. Um, it's a really interesting landscape because it's this beautiful, it's in the Calderdale Valley in West Yorkshire, and it, it sort of goes down in this lovely U shaped valley, and then there's a ridge line, and then it shoots down into this V shaped valley. So, from up on the hilltop where we live, it almost looks like this is the bottom of the valley where all the vegetation is, but actually, it isn't. There's this sunken little valley beyond, and that's where our client's site was, right the way down there. So, from the Hilltops, you couldn't really see it apart from this little area here at Studley Pike, but the site itself would be barely discernible from that viewpoint. And putting pods in there, you're just not going to be able to see them. So the only real views are in the actual surrounding area. So the surrounding lane and the lane here, the bridleway, and the train route coming through. So we really hone in on where it's visible from, and that helps us then design the site. Yeah, the thing to note then, then is um, that we only look at public viewpoints. So we're not going to look at a field where only the sheep can see, um, because unfortunately we don't take in the opinions of the sheep. Um, so we look at public viewpoints, so land building, footpaths, transport routes, places where people work, and in some cases where they live. And then we value those viewpoints, those view visual receptors. So. The methodology that I was talking about before, it's, it's generally known that residents and footpath users will be a high level of sensitivity. Sports activities, train users, um, medium level, and then places of work, funnily enough, is a low level of sensitivity, which I think is a bit mean, because if you're sat for eight hours looking out on a view, I think you're a highly sensitive person, but anyway, that's the sort of standard. And then we move on to the mitigation. So I don't really like to call it mitigation because that makes it seem like you're trying to cover up something bad. So it's really just about good design and how do we design the proposals, taking into account everything we've already learned. So this is a landscape mitigation plan, but before this there would have been lots of iterations of different design proposals um, where uh, we would have looked at different options and where it's viewable from. This site here is viewable from above. So we've gone for green roofs. Um, so there's one of the viewpoints up there, and then and it's looking down on the sites. The train line is on an embankment, look, again, looking down on the sites. So we've got these pods here sunken into the landscape with green roofs. We've got a facilities building. We're going to put a green roof on that. And then we've got this entrance route through underneath the railway and then coming through to the site. So we, we've got a level change here. So we're going to put a dry stone wall in because that's in keeping with the character of the landscape. We're going to soften it with some planting and the edge of the new facilities building. Again, we're going to do that with a stone facade to tie in with this existing wall that comes through here. So the measures that we take from a mitigation point of view um, are there to prevent, reduce, and where possible, offset adverse landscape and visual effects. Proposals should be included within your planning application. So if you include it within your planning application, the, the planning authority will then have the assurance that it's actually going to happen. It's not just a page within the design access statement saying, oh, we might plant some trees. It's actually going to be on your plan alongside your pods. So this is part of what we're proposing, and they know that that can be secured. So the mitigation measures might include adjustment of site levels, alterations to landform, use of appropriate form, materials, colour, planting. 
And then we have enhancement measures. So this is going over and beyond um, the visual and landscape baseline and, and improving um, and showing that we're actually going to improve it. So it's not going to be um, just as it is. It's going to be, we're going to make it even better. So we could be looking at improving the land management, restoring historic and valued features, habitats, enriching agricultural landscapes, and creating new landscapes, habitats, and recreational areas. So when we've gone through all that, we've done our baseline landscape, baseline visual, we've looked at our mitigation, then we make judgments on the magnitude of change. So this is how much of a change we're gonna to make to those viewpoints that we were looking at earlier. Is it gonna be a small change, medium, or high change? Is it gonna be taking over a view with a really big building, or is it just gonna be something quite subtle? And then we can combine the sensitivity with the magnitude of change, and that gives us the results. So it's an either a major, moderate, or a minor level of effect. So that's how the method kind of works in very much a nutshell. And then those levels of effects, we can either say they're beneficial, neutral, or adverse. So often, if we're including, if we're starting off with something quite simple, and there isn't much biodiversity or habitats there, and we're really putting lots of enhancements in, and that's part of our strategy alongside our pods, we can say actually it was a beneficial change that we're putting into the landscape, which always helps. So now getting on to some examples. This first one I talked about a couple of years ago, um, and we were waiting for planning. We now have planning on this, and it, it was approved. So it was an existing lodge park, um, and they wanted to do an expansion of the lodge park, 29 new lodges. And um, they put it in for planning, and it was refused. And then they took us on to do a resubmission of the application. So the planning officer was concerned about the effect on the landscape, and in particular, the views on the way into the village. It's on this l old long Langho Road. So I'll just show you a picture of that. So this is the view that, of, that was of concern. So you can see the existing lodges here, just. <laughs> and then this field here, is where the new lodges were going to go. So they would be visible. It's not this field, so it's not completely um, close to the road, but it's still visible, and it was of concern to the landscape officer. So we went to site, and we analysed um, what was there and what the proposals had been put in. So the planning consultant had put this plan in on the left, and this is a refused scheme. And it's 29 lodges, and those lodges there in blue in particular would be the most visible from that viewpoint. So we had a look at the site and we noticed that there was a plateau in the landscape here, a high point, and the landscape rose from the road up towards this plateau. So we looked at doing a really natural extension of this plateau of the landscape and pulling it out quite naturally. So it's not a forced bond, if you like, it's just extending that plateau out, raising it up just by about half a metre and then descending down as a natural valley down to this river at the bottom. So then we were able to put the lodges on this hillside and they just wouldn't be visible from the road, from that area of concern. So unfortunately, it is a reduction in number. So I think we had about 14 or 16 in the end, I can't remember, but um, so it's not the 29, but it was quite an expensive planning application for the client because you pay per meter squared for each lodge. So it was, a, it was an expensive fee that they put in, but the resubmission is free. So it was, at least they got some lodges through. And one thing to be aware of when, you, when you're doing a planning application is, once you've got that red line in, you can't change it. So there's lots of places I wanted to put those lodges, mostly further down here. But I couldn't because I had to stay within that red line. So that's why we ended up with a smaller number, because that was the capacity of the landscape within that red line. So that's a success story. Um, moving on to another one. So this one is in the Peak District. Is anyone here from the Peak District? You speak to anybody here at the show about the Peak District, and they'll just say, well, you're never going to get glamping in the Peak District. It's like the most strict place for glamping. They will allow caravans and camping, summertime only, and conversion of existing buildings, but no glamping. Um, but there is an exception when you look in the main body of text for the Peak District, and it says, exceptionally, static caravans, chalets, and lodges may be acceptable where they are not intrusive in the landscape. So this site that the client had was very visible in the landscape. So that purple area is the 
area of visual influence which it's viewable from. So quite a long distance. And there's really no tree cover in this area of the Peak District. So you can see the little green belts there. That's the only tree cover. So you can't hide behind any trees. All there are are dry stone walls and this sloping landscape that the site could be seen from from a really long way away. And that's one of the views towards the site. So that's the farmhouse with some trees behind it, just here. And then this is the field where they wanted to put the glamping units. So we thought we'd give it a try. So we went for pre-app. And this is where we try the different design iterations to try and see what we could get through. There was a mineral test pit on site down at the bottom. There's lots of quarrying in the Peak District. So we thought, well, maybe we could take this as a concept. So we did some different mineral test bits across the site and tried to sink the units into those spaces. So there's a little sketch of how it might look and cross-section about how we can hide them in the landscape. Second option we looked at was there's a dry stone wall where that yellow line is along the back. Could we then put a, a faux dry stone wall in front of it and hide the units behind it so that it would still read as one big open field? but we'll be hiding the units behind it. Again, a little sketch of what that might look like, hiding behind the wall there. And the final option we looked at was lime kiln units. There's a lot of lime kilns in this area. That one at the bottom, I think, is particularly interesting. You could see that being a little hobbit glamping unit in the landscape. So we got the pre-app feedback, and as expected, no, they wouldn't accept any glamping on that field. It would be too much of a detrimental effect on the landscape. But they were intrigued by this idea. And part of the national park, any national park across the country, if you can show that you're educating the public about his, the history of the site and what might have happened in that particular landscape, that's seen as a benefit. So to show uh, lime kill units and how they would have worked and take that as a theme would be a good idea. Um, but unfortunately, this couldn't go forward. So the client has had to use buildings on site that they already have and convert them into holiday lets instead but it just shows the process that you can go through to try and work out <clears throat> what you might be able to do. This one, I haven't got any maps for this one, but we've got a couple of sites in historical grounds. So they're quite interesting because they're a landscape character in their own right. So obviously they would have had um, a historical building with a designed landscape around them and perhaps different units within the landscape. So there's stories and uh, ideas that you can play on within those types of landscapes. So they might have an ice house, a folly, or something. Or we had one site where there was wild fowl shooting. So there would have been, and we found an old historical map. They had a gun room and a boathouse. Um, so there's all these sort of ideas that you can play on where you're actually perhaps reinstating the something that was actually there or just playing with the ideas of things that might have been there. So that's one way of sort of ticking the box of lands landscape character and how we can really get into that. And the final example um, is huts within the green belt. So green belt is really tricky. Generally, glamping is a no, um, unless it's very special circumstances. And one of those is outdoor recreation and facilities for outdoor recreation. So for this particular one, it's in an area in Northumberland where there's lots and lots of cycling. And people go for cycle touring holidays. There's really quiet roads. So people really enjoy riding around there. There's lots of different routes around this area. This one wasn't particularly viewable. Lots of hedgerows and woodlands and not that many footpaths. So not many places it was viewable from. But when it comes to Greenbelt, it's not just about whether it's viewable, it's whether it's having an impact on openness. So when I was talking before about the methodology for LVIA, we, there is a written methodology for that, but openness there isn't. But you can make assessments about how you, how you think it's going to affect openness. So this site, the client wanted to put the units up on the field. So the lighter areas are areas that I've identified as more open. And the dark green patches are, is where there's woodland and buildings and there's a bit more enclosure. And the clients wanted to put them up on the fields here, which is quite exposed to views here. And I suggested actually down here, they, we found that there was two sets of hedgerow where I think they would have corralled sheep through to um, a sheep wash. And they were quite close together, these hedges, but it was just a really enclosed um, piece, parcel of land at the bottom of the site. So it would have much less effect on the openness than actually putting the units in the field. 
And then in terms of landscape visual point of view, it really wasn't visible from anywhere because it was so hidden, so hidden in that little fold in the landscape. And that's a view from the surrounding area. So you can see the sites. Um, that's the farmhouse. And then the little tuck in the landscape you just can't see. And, and really, there aren't any views in the landscape because it's all hedgerows. So you have to take your photographs through these gates and these openings because there just is, there's no views. And that's an idea of how it would look in the landscape because it um, slopes down to where these two existing trees, um, hedgerows are, and where we would put the units in the landscape. So you can see the process of the LVIA that we've done results in the final plan where we've got three units nestled between the existing hedgerow and hidden within the landscape. These particular units, I know I was talking about landscape character and tying into what might be there, the local vernacular and things like that. This particular one took its inspiration from bike wheels because it was for cycle touring holidays. I mean, sometimes there just aren't any um, existing small buildings in the landscape to take inspiration from, so you have to use a bit of inspiration. Um, but that's quite an interesting one to look at. Um, so yeah, do we really need landscape and visual appraisal? Um, so it's all about proportionality. The level of detail within an assessment should reflect the scale and nature of the proposed development. So for glamping projects, an LVIA is not likely. It's not a nuclear power plant. It's not a major train route. It's not the HS2. But a landscape visual appraisal might be more appropriate. And a very light touch assessment within the design and access statement might be appropriate. So what we do now is we do this small scale level of appraisal within our pre-app documents or, and, then, and then our design and access documents. And we've had planning officers say to us that it's really helpful because they, almost doing their work for them, they can show that it's not going to be uh, of a negative impact on the landscape. So it's really helpful to do this right from the start. So, you know, looking back on that lodge park example, they hadn't done this process and they just sort of plonked these lodges on there and not gone through this assessment stage. And I'd say any... any um, any project should start at this point and, and take this route because it really informs your design. So in principle, yes, I think you do need a landscape visual appraisal to inform your design and justify your design process to the local authority. But do you need a 50-page document LVIA? I'd say possibly not. <laughs> so that's all. Any questions? Yeah, I mean, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because you want to hide things, but you want to be able to look out and see those views. So we always start on site. And it, I mean, that's an aspect that I've not covered in this talk, but it is all about the experience. So we definitely look at that too. Um, so it's about, yeah, hiding it, but being able to see those views. Yeah, if you're in a site where you've got fantastic views, you want to sell that, don't you? So yeah, there's a subtle, subtle sort of difference to it. I mean, with the example in the Peak District there, we were always having part of the unit so that you can look out, but hiding the rest of it. So, you know, are there some windows where we can have those views? Um, we're staying in the Shepherd's Hut actually nearby in Kenilworth, and you can see the Kenilworth Castle from there, but they've took the Shepherd's Hut out of the way. So actually, when you are picnicking outside, you can see the view, but when you're in the Shepherd's Hut, you can't, well, you can just about see it through the end window, but you can see how they wanted to give those views, but hide it and took it away at the same time. So it is a difficult one, but I think it's possible. So yeah, we're, we're thinking about experience and um, ultimately we're working for you and making a really nice damping site. But these are just things we have in mind to tick the box for the planners, but also to design a really nice site. So we're thinking about arrival experience and where we can tuck away the parking area and make sure that the cars aren't seen, all of these types of things. Yeah, we look at that alongside this process. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers.